Okay, so you can all hold on a sec here. You can there. You can all see the screen, so that's great. So thank you, everyone. I'm going to do a little looking up while I'm talking to you because my presentation is on my big screen and I'm looking at you in my small screen. So um, thanks for the introduction, Helen. And first of all, I want to send my appreciation to the Rural and Remote Division of Family Practice for inviting me to do this. I mean, it's a great honor to be asked to do this and I take this work very seriously. I also want to acknowledge that I am coming to you from Gabriola Island, which is in the unceded stolen territory of the Snunemu people. Uh, I say stolen because they had signed a treaty with the Crown in, I think it was 1860, around then, that within two years of signing the treaty, it was breached. And they had, had traditionally used this island seasonally and all that land was taken away from them. So um, I'm, I have the fortune to be here, um, but they don't. And I hope that that gets remedied soon. So um, I wanted to also let you know a bit about my involvement in the Rural and Remote Division of Family Practice. I'm not on the board, but I do sit on two committees, the Board Development Committee and the Policy Committee. And I've done that for the last year and I had the pleasure of working with Liz Wynott um, on at least one of those, policy or development, maybe both, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, both. both, oh good, <laughs> I thought I was seeing a lot of you. <laughs> so the other thing is I'm in, involved in some research activities which really inform the work that I do. I'm involved with the Rural Community Resilience Project with Jude Cornelson at UBC and also with the Climate Change and Ecosystem Disruption Adaptation Responses in Rural BC Project with Dr. Stefan Drabowski and Dr. Alona Hale. Now I'm, um, I'm a, a, a tag on to those two projects. They're very, uh, ge very generously allowed me to come along and contribute some of my research. My own research is, uh, examines how rural communities have responded to the impacts of global capital. So I'm delighted to be able to bring the results of my PhD dissertation into the work that's being done uh, with these two projects. So today, what I would like to do is tell you a story of crises and of responses and systems transformation and the critical role that community played in that. So somewhere I hit a button and things go, no, it's not that button. Nope, not that button, hold on. How about that button? How's that? Is that okay? That looks good. If, okay. if your next slide is up, context and crisis. Yeah, that's it. Good. Okay. <laughs> So I wanna tell you a little bit about the community first to another, in order to understand um, what it means to be developing a primary care network uh, and um, primary care services within the context of community. For a lot of people, Gabriola is just a beautiful place with a lot of hippies and lots of arts and nice beaches, et cetera. But in fact, it's not all beaches and sunshine. Uh, we have a population of about 4,400 and a median age of 63, which means, I know you know this, but half the population is over 63 and half the population is under 63. 24% of our residents live in low income, that's 10% higher than the BC average, and 38% of our children live in poverty. And one in 65 Gabriolans is homeless. Now that's four times higher than Nanaimo and 10 times higher than the BC average. So access to island services are challenging. We're a ferry dependent community. We're, although we're only five kilometers from Nanaimo, uh, the demand for the ferry far exceeds the availability. We have 16 sailings a day and yet we have to wait one and a half to two hours just to get on the ferry. So you can imagine if you rely on services in Nanaimo, what a challenge it is to get there. Also, there's no ferry service between 11 o'clock at night and five in the morning, which means that medical emergencies are dealt with by our doctors and BC ambulance during that time. And it's a good thing we have an urgent treatment facility. So there was two crises that occurred in the community at two different periods. 
The first was um, the crisis of not being able to retain doctors in the community. When I moved here in 2004, there was a revolving door of doctors. We had one doctor who was retired here and had a practice, which you know, he was able to maintain consistently. But in order to attract any other doctors, they just faced such a lot of problems in terms of a place to practice, um, the fact that that medical uh, uh, specialized services were only available in in Nanaimo, there was no ability to operate in the team environment, and there were very few resources on the island to address the social determinants of health, which is of course a critical consideration in in overall health. So the. The, the final straw, I think, was when the BC ferry system eliminated the after hours emergency evacuation ferry service, which meant that any doctor practicing here was literally faced with um, dealing with life and death crises in the middle of the night uh, with no way of getting off the island. So the result of that, of course, was we had a terrible time recruiting doctors and there was no body to recruit them. There was no entity on Gabriola that was able to uh, do that work. So many Gabrielans had their doctors in Nanaimo, and that lack of local health care had a profound effect on the health of Gabrielans and ultimately the potential to create a sustainable local economy. So that was one crisis. The second crisis came um, in 2011. So we had between 2011 and 2013 we had eight suicides on Gabriola and three suicides in eight months in 2013. And during that year, the RCMP responded to 14 mental health calls, a suicide attempt and seven cases of suicidal ideation. And the mental health calls that they received were only exceeded by motor vehicle accidents in terms of their calls. Other than our doctors and police, there were no on-island resources to support people with mental health issues. Excuse me while I turn the page. So how did we respond to the doctor retention issue? So what we recognized as a community is that we needed a facility that could ensure our doctors had a well-designed, affordable, accessible space to practice. To do that, the community came together to raise funds to build a permanent health care center with urgent treatment capacity. With the creation of the Gabriela Healthcare Society in 2007, the center was built using volunteers, donated land, and donations of cash, goods, and services. The photo on the left shows the clinic that I went to with one doctor when I first arrived here. It's pretty bleak. It was pretty bleak for her and for her patients. And the photo on the right, of course, is our new health center, which opened in June 2012. Now the new ho center hosts four doctors, a nurse practitioner, locums, and other healthcare services, such as a mental health nurse, social worker, community care workers, and a medical lab. I had the pleasure of going out for a walk with one of our newest doctors, Dr. Ramak Shadmani, the other night, and she said to me, this is the most beautiful health center I've ever worked in. It's the most beautiful health center I've ever seen, <laughs> which was very heartwarming, right? And I'm glad because the whole purpose of this was to create a space where doctors felt uh, supported, welcome, and had the tools and resources that they needed to do their work. So the result of that response by our community is that we had a 90% decrease in visits to Nanaimo Regional General Hospital Emergency Ward and an estimated savings to Island Health of $200,000 a year. Of course, we also had very much happier patients who had a doctor on the island who value our doctors and who love our healthcare facility and are very supportive of the work that's being done. So the second crisis, our suicide crisis. Um, addressing the suicide crisis really required a community response. Um, so what happened was, uh, 
an ad hoc grassroots citizen led community emerged our community um, committee emerged from the community. And it was open to any individual or organization that could help to address the problem. This included our doctors, first responders, police, social service agency, and Island Health. The impact of that coming together was that over a two year period, the mental health action team was able to convince the health authority. It took a little doing, <laughs> they, they, they kept thinking they were going to be able to just get us to come to Nanaimo for our mental health services, but we convinced them to provide a mental health nurse and eventually a social worker. It was interesting getting them to give us the mental health nurse. It started out half time and, uh, and we tried to explain to them how difficult it was for somebody. Imagine if you're depressed, right? Um, being told that you had to go to Nanaimo to get service and sitting in the ferry line or just getting yourself to the ferry line up, sitting there, getting over there, coming back, right? And so we tried to explain that. And I know if you don't live it, you don't know it, right? So what happened is the first mental health nurse, wonderful woman came, she was part-time. She quit after six months because she couldn't stand the uncertainty of the ferry and she couldn't stand the lineups, right? So eventually we got a full-time mental health nurse and a social worker who both live on the island, which makes an enormous difference. Uh, the second thing that happened was a kind of transformatory moment. And that was uh, one of our doctors on the committee, Dr. Tracy Thorne suggested that the mental health uh, action team transform into a collaborative uh, to address community health and well-being focusing on the social determinants of health. Uh, because in her opinion, and I think she was right, our job was done, but there were other issues to be ad uh, 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 addressed. So the, cre the purpose, the, the creation of the Gabriel Health and Wellness uh, Collaborative was um, an opportunity to create uh, the opportunity for mutual support, shared advocacy and improved use of funding resources in order to improve the health of all Gabriolans. The organization has 40 members that meet annually, and there's a core group of 26 organizations that meet monthly to set and achieve healthcare priorities. Now that core group of 26 is a bit ironic because initially we'd started off with our 40, and we said, well, I think we need a little core that gets together and does some of the keeping the thing moving, you know, and, and making sure that their what projects are developed or implemented and communicating with the members, etc. So when we put out a call to the membership to say, who wants to be on the core, we got 26 people who wanted to be on the core. So we have a very large core. So they do meet monthly and they uh, are responsible for planning projects. Uh, for coordinating activities, for public education, and for making sure that the broader community of members uh, know what's going on and have an opportunity to influence health planning decisions on the island. So the thing that's interesting, I think, about this organization is that it's non-hierarchical in structure. We have a chair and reporting that happens and is rotated between members. So no, no one person is in charge. It's shared across members. Now, to be honest, there is probably out of the 26, maybe seven or eight who take that responsibility on, but they're happy to do that and nobody carries the full load. The other thing is it's a voluntary network. It's not a nonprofit. So it has no formal status. It has no ability to uh, fundraise, receive funds, et cetera, which can be a problem, but we've worked that out by in fact, uh, aligning ourselves with the Gabriola Healthcare Collaborative, or not collaborative, foundation, which is the parent foundation for the healthcare center. That's the group that created the center. And they do have charitable status so that when we need to do things, we can go to them and get, to get them to help us. It's multi-sectoral in membership, it includes uh, representation from health, public safety, economic, cultural, and environmental and ecumenical representation. And as I mentioned, it receives no funding. And the collaborative meets quarterly, interestingly, with the health authority as a local collaborative services committee. 
So under normal circumstances, we would be part of the larger collaborative services committee, which is in the Nanaimo area, but we have our own little collaborative services committee for which we are very grateful. So I just, I wanna tell you about some of the successes that have come out of this approach. So the health center, I, um, and you'll see the link here on the page um, and feel free to, um, uh, when you get the copy of this PowerPoint uh, to go and take a look at these links. They're very interesting. There's a lot of information there. So the, the health center itself, as I mentioned, has now got four doctors and a nurse practitioner, mental health nurse and social worker, as well as an urgent treatment facility. They provide team-based care and access to urgent care. And our doctors now, um, I think we're one of the very earliest group, uh, doctors to have a group service contract. Uh, so it's a whole different funding model for our doctors. And we got the early draw nurse practitioner, which has made an enormous difference uh, to the workflow and the way that the doctors are able to practice. Um, there are other allied health professionals in the health center, including the medical lab, community care services, and dental care. So that is for us a great success. And um, although we've had doctors retire and one doctor leave, uh, we are now, I think, up to close to having our full complement. And although we haven't been able to, uh, to address the needs of all Gabrielans to have a doctor on the island, we're slowly, or, well, the doctors are slowly chipping away at the wait list to make sure every Gabrielan who wants one can have a doctor on the island. The collaborative um, has, has had enormous successes uh, just in, in, in at the very basic level of bringing all the organizations on the community together. And one thing that's not showing on this screen is that when, uh, and I should have added it and I'm sorry, when COVID hit, the collaborative, I mean, we all sort of were stunned when COVID hit and not quite sure what to do. And I remember Dr. Thorne saying to me one day, this is very serious. And I, I sort of thought about it and realized it took me about two weeks to figure out that the collaborative could be the vehicle for coordinating action across the community. Because of course, um, all communities were faced with significant challenges with COVID, but because we're a ferry dependent community, our planning also had to consider things like, what if the ferry workers get sick and we can't staff our ferry? How do we get our food? How do we get our supplies? How do we get sick people on and off the island? So the collaborative uh, pulled together a COVID response team uh, we met twice a week for six weeks and then it was once every two weeks and then finally everything was organized and we disbanded so that was a great success the other thing is that we work really closely at least up until covid um, when the with the met with the medical health officers um, now they're really busy with a bunch of other things but we do work very closely with the medical health officers to get to capture health data and that helps us set priorities and uh, do implementation planning. Pretty much everything we do in the collaborative is based on data. Um, and, uh, and that's not just statistical data, but the experience of people with lived experience in our communities and, uh, and what organizations know. So we bring all that knowledge together uh, to make our case in developing and, and uh, advocating for services. So we have, I can give you some examples um, of some of the things we do in addition to our annual planning event, which brings together MHOs, um, the, all of the doctors, all of the agencies, the 40 agencies, plus their representatives from their boards and their staff um, to do an annual planning event in the community, uh, which is what the, then we focus on delivering over the next year or two. So some of the other initiatives we've done is the MAMA Mood Maternal Depression Project that was led by Dr. Tracy Thorne. We also recruited uh, and trained 20 local home care workers in partnership with the People for a Healthy Community, which is our, uh, our, our food security program, Island Health and the Vancouver Island University. And with the support of the Gabriola Healthcare Foundation, the collaborative researched and published 
uh, the Gabriola 2020 health report, which captures all the statistical data you could ever want to know about this community. It goes far beyond the sort of medical data that you might imagine, but looks at every single social determinant of health for our community and how we're functioning. Um, the link for that is there, and we also produced a video of the results. So for people who don't want to read through a long, um, a long report, which is actually done more like a, um, what do you call those, uh, those things you have in communities? I know Tofino's got one. It's like a, a, yeah, I can't remember the name of it, but you know what I mean, right? It's, uh, it's kind of a health report that's in graphic form. Yeah, and it's funded by somebody and I can't remember who it is. So excuse me, but um, yeah, so there's lots of communities that have those. We just did our own because we didn't have the money to do the, the grander approach to that. So I just wanna say that although we've had many successes and we're really proud of those successes, we also face ongoing challenges. So we, we know that the three things that are facing us right now is that our our UTF, our urgent treatment facility, is underfunded. We have an unfunded community health network, and we aren't quite to the place of getting a PCN status yet, right? So in terms of the underfunding of the urgent treatment facility, the health authority will only contribute, because we built it ourselves, it's not their facility, it's ours, they will only contribute toward the cost of the urgent treatment facility for the portion of the facility its staff use even though provincial policy proposes that all communities will have access to urgent treatment. So to maintain the facility, the foundation must carefully manage revenue from facility tenants and donors to ensure that funds can be set aside for long-term maintenance, such things as replacement of major equipment, HVAC systems, things like that. It's a big facility and maintenance of things like the helipad. The second issue, the unfunded community health network is uh, regarding the collaborative. So, so the collaborative, as I mentioned, uh, is not funded and is a network, but it acts as a community health network and it receives no funding from the health authority. Instead, it's considered to be part of the yet to be created Nanaimo health network. Um, and I think you can imagine the challenges that that would evolve with a, a group based in Nanaimo, largely urban, uh, understanding and planning for the needs of this community. Um, I'm part of the developing Nanaimo Health Network because I felt if, if we can't get funding for ours, at least I could inform the way it was de designed and developed. So I'm doing that. But as a result of, not, of that, the collaborative, our little collaborative, um, the burden of health and wellness planning for our community rests on the back of volunteers. And so funding for our annual event, which is a huge deal, and things like the publications of the Gabriel, Gabriela House Report has to be found through other sources. And we are very grateful uh, to the Gabriela Healthcare Foundation and to the division for supporting us in doing those activities. The last issue, of course, is the PCN status. Now, our, our Gabriela Healthcare Center has an integrated team-based model of, of care and the collaborative with its network approach to community health planning, both of those things predate provincial policy directing access to urgent treatment and community health networks. So um, it's a little befuddling but we are continuing to pursue all, all the avenues, working with our Collaborative Services Committee, and we're heartened by Revelstoke's success. Uh, I understand their, uh, their EOI was just approved, um, expression of interest, that is, was just approved. So that's, that's great news, and we're really, we're really pleased and we'll look forward to hearing uh, what worked for them so that we can learn from that. So, just for the last slide, I want to just suggest to you that there may be some lessons that we could take from this. And I, I do want to read that quote because I think it's kind of important. To the extent that planners and elected representatives wish to see a more empowered citizenry, it must be achieved by opening spaces rather than granting permissions 
or imagining that the state can authorize and sanction the expression of community will. So I wanna talk just briefly about what it means to open spaces that allow the full expression of capacities. There are several lessons I think we can take from this. So first, our success on Gabriola wouldn't have happened without engaged physicians. Whether it was the planning for the Gabriola Health Center or the mental health planning uh, or the collaborative, our physicians have been part of the process. Dr. Bosman, who is now retired, was very much on board with developing the health center. Drs. Thorne and Bosman were both deeply involved in the mental health action group. And Drs. Thorne and Mershevsky are currently engaged in the collaborative. They were open to our community's ideas. And I want to emphasize that this isn't just about Gabriola. My research when I was writing my dissertation took me to Tumblr Ridge and Tofino, and I met doctors in those communities. Dr. Charles Helm, Helm in Tumblr Ridge, who was deeply involved in the community. He was a real force to be reckoned with. And similarly, Dr. Pam Frizzi in Tofino uh, really uh, um, emphasized the role that engaged physicians can play in changing uh, the health outcomes in communities, not through just direct practice, but through the way they engage in their communities. Second, I want to suggest that uh, we park our egos when we're doing this work. Um, whether you're a citizen with a lot of bright ideas or whether you're a health professional, you only get the best out of each other when you come together with humility around a common goal. And this is a sort of an apocryphal story that goes with this because I was the person who raised the issue of the suicides and sent out the invitation to anybody I could think would be uh, uh, helpful in addressing the problem. And I remember at the first meeting, so I invited every doctor I could find and the, you know, the ambulance folks and the police and the, we didn't have a social worker, Island Health, anybody I could think of, right? And I remember at that first meeting where it's about 12 of us in the boardroom and I'm sitting at the head of the table and at the other end of the table is a retired physician uh, hadn't been practicing on Gabriel, had come to the community for somewhere else. And he said to me, under whose authority did you convene this meeting? And it was one of those moments where I literally, um, I was sort of knocked back in my chair because I, I really had that moment of thinking, oh my God, I don't have the authority, like under whose authority, right? And I realized that um, it's our responsibility as citizens. It's everyone's responsibility. You don't need authority to be responsible. You don't need authority to act. And that's in small communities, we don't have the luxury of giving privilege to authority over the interests of citizens who want to help. So that was a real aha moment for me. So um, that, that it was, it was, and everything was fabulous. I mean, the committee just lit on fire and took off and they were just great. Uh, that person didn't continue with the committee. <laughs> and and the, sec the third thing is, you know, I think it's really one of the things that we learned when we were doing this work is how important it is to be inclusive. Don't restrict, restrict your network to those who have healthcare expertise only bring in people with a wide range of skills and knowledge and build on local knowledge and assets because a healthy community depends on taking a broad systems approach. The social, the environmental, and the economic must all be considered when we're looking at the health of the community. So hold on a sec here. So the fourth thing, I want to emphasize is that when you're getting started, structure should be your last concern. The structure will evolve from having a shared purpose. And I, I think I encourage people to be okay with a loose structure. Uh, networks can be powerful mechanisms. Much of the time that I'm doing work in the community, the first thing people want to talk about is who's in charge, what's the structure going to be, how are we going to get funding and what structure will get us there. I don't think that that's the place to start. I think we start with purpose and, and a common objective. 
and then you figure out what's going to work to get you there. And finally, I think the last lesson that I take from this is that you adopt approaches based on incremental persistence rather than expecting actions to result in conclusive or revolutionary change. Gabriola can learn about persistence from indigenous communities. The Snanemu have worked for over 150 years to get what was taken from them through the breached Douglas Treaty. I think our problems look kind of puny in comparison and the very least we could do is persist. So I am now happy to take your questions <laughs> and I will stop this. Thank you so much, Diane. I so appreciate when presentations start off with a, a story, they just sort of draw you in. Um, although it was, you know, tough to hear some of the uh, stats that you were sharing, but that isn't dissimilar to other rural and remote communities. Um, so we're at 3.22, um, we have plenty of time for questions. I see that we have one question here from Joanna Trimble. Um, Joanna, do you want to ask the question or should I just read? Oh, uh, why don't you do oh Joanna, you're breaking up a little bit. It might be easier if I... I'm on a very unstable uh, uh, platform right here. Please do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so how, um, how do you or did you handle the heat dome emergency this past summer? Do you have a registry of vulnerable islanders and a plan to reach and help them when emergencies occur? Yeah, so I would say that our, our People for a Healthy Community is our community social service agency. And I think they are pretty much in touch with every vulnerable Gabriolan. So they, and I can't speak for them because I wasn't involved directly, but I know that they have, uh, that they know where all the homeless folks are. They have multiple seniors programs, especially for vulnerable um, and shut in seniors. Big issue for us, we're an island that is well dependent, well and sister independent, right? People don't turn on their taps and get water. And also people who are, do not have heat pumps, do not have the luxury of air conditioning. So I, I, I'm pretty sure that PHC was in touch with those folks and ensuring that they had a supply of water and that they could have access to uh, cooling uh, or resources where they could be safe during the heat dome event. And we had it here too, it was extreme. Um, never saw temperatures like that on Gabriola or anywhere on the, on the island. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Well, I always have lots in my back pocket. Rhonda says I'm always asking lots of questions. <laughs> um, I'm really curious, um, Diane, you indicated that the collaborative does not have funding. Um, it's very organic and I'm just curious what what you might use that funding for. And I guess maybe I'm also gonna relate this a little bit to the health network, because I do understand on the island that there are health networks that are funded by Island Health. What do they fund? What, how do they, what would be the benefit and the value of having a health authority funded health network? Yeah, I, I think it's a question of administration more than anything and uh, project management and event planning uh, and implementing. So uh, those health networks have a coordinator and that coordinator is uh, a full, I'm not sure they're full time, but they have a position that allows them to organize meetings with participants, set agenda, consult with participants, uh, engage with uh, other uh, resources, contracts to get, for instance, strategic planning, et cetera. Uh, so they're not constantly doing all the basic heavy lifting of managing to get a monthly meeting going, arranging locations for the meeting, doing the minutes and all of that sort of thing. It's, it's pretty rudimentary, but the other piece, of course, is the implementing the project. So, um, you know, we've implemented a number of projects, but every time we implement them, we have to go and look for funding. 
So it's a core, it's a core administrative function plus support for program implementation. Thank you. Um, Don. And um, thank you, Diana. That was a, a very nice uh, summary. I want to ask, uh, how do you see moving forward from here? How would you prioritize the, the steps or what do you think the issues that um, need to be addressed or for the preparation as you as we move forward? Yeah, that's a, it's complicated for a couple of reasons. One is because we don't seem to fit within the health authority or ministry of health boxes uh, for things like uh, uh, PCN or community health network, et cetera, we have two roads that we can go down. One is to continue to persist, to expect, advocate for, and ask for a funding. It doesn't have to be to the same scale as large centers, but some funding to get this work done in our community. And we certainly will continue to pursue the PCN. In the meantime, the way forward for us is to work across organizations. So uh, in my opinion, and Don, you and I are both on the board of the foundation. So you and I both know this. Um, the foundation, which has a mandate, not just to deliver that beautiful facility and keep it running and make sure our doctors are happy, it also has a responsibility to ensure all Gabriolans have access to primary health care services, right? To the full range of primary health care services. So um, while we're waiting for the health authority to catch up to our needs and, and find a way to help us do that, I think we have to work between the foundation and the collaborative to manage these two processes. One is the building and the other is the access to primary health services in the community and to complement and supplement each other's efforts. The only place with money is the foundation, but they have incredible burdens in keeping the foundation or the facility going. So, but we have to struggle with that until at such time as we can get the health authority and the ministry of health to acknowledge that we uh, are deserving of some resources to get this function fully funded. Does it seem that we could build on some of the work that's just gone on? For example, the contract with the nurse practitioner, the way the doctors are moving forward with the negotiations for their own contractual um, basis, things like that, where there is a working relationship with, uh, with the ministry and to some extent with the um, um, rural and remote doctors division. Yeah, yeah, and you're right. And you know, that's a, we've talked about that. And one of the things is the, the push now to, to uh, offer um, allied health uh, professionals, it, it, you know, an opportunity for us to apply for other allied health services, right? So I would like to look at that. And I know um, working with our, our chapter coordinator, looking at what that might look like, uh, how it could be designed in a way that meets the needs of Gabriolans for access to primary health care services. So we're, we're doing that and we're thinking, we're trying to think a little bit outside the box, but no, not so outside the box that we alarm anybody. We just want to think outside the box enough that we can get our needs met and bring the array of services that Gabriolans need to have. Uh, thank you. And I see that David has uh, put a question in the chat box. Oh. Um, his question is there population based primary care funding for rural communities and as far as I know there is. Well, and, and you would be the person that could explain this to me more carefully I think the number the magic number appears to be 10,000. Yeah, things have evolved. Um, and they're not looking at those numbers specifically anymore. Um, so I think probably that's one thing that we should bring to the next um, Gabriola CSC is that some conversation around what PCN looks like and, and talk about inviting Emma Isaac from the ministry and Sherry Gale and a few other folks. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, you know, I think what they're wanting is for us to come forward um, and, and, you know, present sort of an expression of interest in that to engage in service planning and to present something, you know, reasonable and realistic um, for, you know, what makes the most sense for the community. They are still looking at attachment numbers. <laughs> Um, so that is a little bit of a challenge um, in terms of how they allocate funding. Um, for many of our more rural and remote communities, I think, um, especially yours, which is quite a bit, is smaller than, for example, Salt Spring Island. Yeah. Um, there's not a huge, uh, a significant investment, but there are positions that are typically available. The other um, aspect to this uh, for larger urban divisions, they often get um, some administrative funding to administer and manage the primary care network. Mm -hmm. uh, but typically that's not something that we would be receiving. We may get some um, small, you know, a, a small amount of overhead or something like that. But we can we can chat a little bit about that. Yeah, but no, that's really helpful. I think the other thing that I should have mentioned at the beginning too is although the population according to our MSP registrations is 4,415. 28 percent of the uh, properties on the island are unoccupied or the houses are unoccupied by the usual residents, which means that we have an, another 28 percent of people who come here at some point during the year. Plus, we have a huge tourism mm -hmm. boost in the summer. So it, I would not be surprised uh, if during the summer we're hitting double our population easily, double our population. And so that, that ebb and flow has um, a real effect on our doctors because they see people because they don't go, oh, do you live here? <laughs> mm -hmm. They see people who are in need of their services. So mm -hmm. yeah, so it's, it, and I, I agree, Helen, I think, I think we're on a path working with you and Angela and with the CSC towards trying to solve this problem. Um, I do strongly feel that the ministry needs to really think hard about what it means to be a rural community and stop shoeboxing rural communities into some generalized statement about what rural is. There's mm -hmm. lots of literature out there that gives you all kinds of ways of understanding rurality. Uh, and I don't think they're looking at it. And I mm -hmm. really think when they start making policies that then go down to the health authority and the health authority says they're constrained by this policy box, that they're not doing favors to communities who are in the trenches, mm -hmm. I hate that expression, but doing the work, right? We're doing the work. Yeah. So either help us or move out of the way and let us get on with things. Mm -hmm. That's my cheeky response to that. Yeah, I think we're in a bit of a tipping point. We have four of the chapters on Vancouver Island are talking about submitting EOIs. And I think there's a lot of power in that to bring Good. forth information um, that you're speaking about in terms of why and how rural is different. So I think that might be something taking to take forward is that we collaborate among the chapters on that, which we do anyhow, so it will likely come about. Um, I don't know if there's another question, but I'll just uh, jump in really quick. Um, I'm Occasionally, there is a reluctance to embark on um, a comprehensive community engagement activity uh, because there's fear of um, that it's going to be complicated, it's going to be time consuming, it's going to set up false expectations, you know, be careful what you wish for, all of those things. It's not always, but sometimes I hear that. And I'm just curious, what would you say to someone who would t say that to you? Any one of those um, sort of negatives about engaging community? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that question because um, I've been part of those engagements when they come from governments or health authorities, which is in reference to my statement about the state <laughs> in my last slide. And, and it is this, um, don't underestimate the ability of communities to understand the context of what government is working in. And don't 
force people into false choices by presenting information to them in a way that they can only make prescribed answers to prescribed questions. It is so disingenuous and, it, and it's so insulting. It's such a waste of their time and it's a waste of the community's time. The reason we're successful in Gabriola is we ask honest questions, we're prepared to hear anybody's opinion, we work with what we have and we work through the problems. And nobody in Gabriel is walking around saying they expect something because we had a community consultation. And when we have them, we have huge community consultations. I mean, pre-COVID, we had um, you know, 200 people in the community hall talking about what the hard to discuss questions in the community were. That was the whole topic. What is it that is hard to talk about that we need to tackle? And 200 people showed up to have that conversation because they didn't get put in a box. They didn't get told how they were gonna think about it. And anybody's opinion was valued. So I think that would be what I would say. I mean, and if health authorities or the ministry or whomever is gonna come out and do a genuine process, consult with the community. We'll tell you what the triggers are in the community. We'll tell you what things to avoid and how to frame things and what the local context is. But don't come out with this canned approach. It's just, it's insulting. It's not effective and it's a waste of their time and our money because we're the people who are paying for it. I'm having so much fun here. What can I say? <laughs> Thank you, Dan. I'm, um, I'm curious if anyone else um, who's here um, has any experience with similar community engagement, outreach, um, any sort of work around PCN planning or any other community engagement that they'd be willing and interested to share with the group. Monica, can I put you on the spot to talk a little bit about the work that you've done in terms of having a few community events to around some of your um, primary care planning? Or is it a little premature? <laughs> um, certainly, Helen, but I have a, a oh. really poor connection right now. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, it's a little bit no? broken. I do, it's Maybe if she turns off her video, and it'll be better. I'm sorry, I, I fear that it's quite poor. Oh, it's so fine I would be now happy if you feel comfortable. Just to speak really briefly that the community engagement that we have undertaken in Whistler was was quite broad and extensive and led to the creation of a separate or arm's length um, society, uh, which is seeking charitable status. So basically the community came together very broadly, it was facilitated well by Sue Davies, who many of you know well and know her work. And uh, we had um, our First Nations represented, we had some representation from Vancouver Coastal. I believe the Pemberton division was invited as well. Um, don't know if you were there specifically, Helen, but I think some of your doctors may have been, it may have been before your time. Um, local community agencies, not-for-profits that deliver social services, our CMPs, school district, uh, mayor and council, um, former councillors, current councillors, um, the, in Whistler, the Hotel Employers Association, which is a big driver of unattached patients with about, I want to say 7,000 staff rotating through the community, but I could be stating that incorrectly annually. Um, so a big generator of people just arriving and needing some degree of care, but not necessarily having a position. Um, are you hearing me clearly enough? Shall I continue? Yeah, yeah. loud and clear. Yes. Nods from, from Diane. All right. Um, so from that group came um, a small but dedicated uh, number of citizens in the community. Um, I should also include we invited charitable foundations such as the Whistler Black Home Foundation, Rotary, Lions, groups, all of the local suspects who might have an interest um, in seeing healthcare succeed. Um, so uh, from that group, we had overwhelming response, people reaching out and wanting to be involved. And that has really driven the decision making in, in Whistler. Um, family practitioners obviously were included. That's our, that's our core group. Um, and we invited them to um, participate to the extent of their interest and always kept the door open for those who perhaps uh, were not engaged early, but once they learned what uh, was going on, that they um, found they were quite engaged. 
So basically what it boiled down to in Whistler is status quo will not support us. If we continue the way we have arranged ourselves for the previous decade, we will fail. We will fail our community, we will fail our practices, and the individual practitioners will just struggle beyond words. So from that, um, we seem to have been off to a good start. We have a core group that is very dedicated to um, singular principles that along the way were defined according to the PCN plan as we knew it at the time. So in all of our work, we made sure that alignment was possible, um, which opens us up then if the not-for-profit or the charitable foundation does decide to move forward and create a space, whether it's physical or virtual, um, will the building acquire a building? We don't know yet what that will look like. Um, we can then um, ensure that we're already prepared to do onboard PCN resources should there be desired. Um, independent governance is the key driver of this work. There has to be independent community-driven decision-making or the work from the doctor's perspective will not be successful. And Dr. Klein is on the line. Dr. Klein is our physician co-lead for the community of Squamish, about an hour away from Whistler, an hour south. And um, I can't speak um, with great confidence, but Dr. Klein probably can, uh, that there's a desire to move forward in a similar fashion, um, you know, a Squamish fashion, but a similar fashion fashion as well, and build on that good work in Whistler. Yeah, Monica, I'll, I'll uh, agree with Under you. Larry, if you might. Yeah, I'll agree with you. I think we'd like to move forward in a similar fashion. It seems like it's worked very well. Thank you so much uh, for sharing, Monica. Um, it's super exciting, all the work you've done. It's, um, it's always so impressive to think about sort of um, all the work that goes behind actually making contact with all those different groups. It's not just inviting someone to a meeting, it's actually sitting down, having a conversation, sharing the ideas. I'm sure, Diane, this is, you know, part of the work that you were doing. It's kind of building that shared vision and knowledge and excitement. And before you have that first meeting, there's a lot of effort and a lot of work that goes into that community relationship building. And it is, Helen, you're right. It, it, everything is relationship building. And I take that as well from my experience of learning from Indigenous people. It's everything is relationships and it's true for all of us. So you, you, you start from your first encounter building that relationship. And even though you may have strong disagreements about things, um, you try and keep people in the tent and build those relationships. And as I said earlier, and David, you remarked on this in your chat in the chat, it's about uh, common purpose, right? Because if you can get people to agree on a common purpose, then everything else kind of falls away. We can talk about, okay, so how are we going to get there? And all of our political or social strata differences can be moved to the side because we have something we're working towards in relationship. Um, I'm just looking at, I think there are Monica's comments. Um, any other comments, questions? David, are you looking to do some community engagement in Ashcroft? Uh, I, I've, I've been sitting here deep, deep in thought simply because of the fact that we did a community engagement. Oh, it has to be eight or nine years ago that was very successful and started us moving. Okay. But it was before there was any of the stuff that's now available. And so I'm trying to figure out how uh, we can reintroduce and redo that in order, because now there is a path that we could walk on following that community engagement. Before there was the community engagement that there was literally nowhere for it to go. And uh, so this has been, really exciting for me to try and figure out how we do that and how we do that 
while, while honoring that past engagement and, mm -hmm. and bringing it to the fore again, but at the same time being totally open and listening to what's there now, which a lot of this is going to be the complaints about <laughs> the fact that it's taken us this long to get to square one. Yeah, I can imagine it's always tricky. I, I wonder, Diane, if you can speak more to this, but what I thought about is that shared purpose and that shared vision and how important it is because it helps, at least it's that con constant. I mean, obviously it's gonna change but, um, you know, the initiatives are all going to be changing and the people will be changing around that. Mm -hmm. um, but Diane, what are your thoughts based on what David, any suggestions or <laughs> advice or does anyone else have any thoughts? Well, I, I would say um, we're coming up to this with our collaborative on Gabriola is um, it, it's been about six years since we started down this road. And I think it's time for us to revisit what is our purpose? Uh, are we still focusing on the right things? What are we? What are our objectives? What are the results that we want to achieve? And I think that's probably true for any organization: is that you've got to ask, constantly ask that question. And I, I really like the model of of doing that kind of planning that asks people to imagine ten years from now if your group or your organization is successful, how will your community be different? to really get people to focus on the future, the desired future, and then you can work towards something. Because otherwise you get kind of stuck in the stasis, right? Of this is what we do and we just do it over and over again. So yeah, and purpose always needs to be revisited. Uh, and it also needs to be adhered to until, until such a time as you revisit it. But it needs to be that core because often people get ideas and they're not actually attached to the purpose. Right, and you have to stop yourself and say, "Okay, hold on a sec. Is this where we were heading? Is this is what we all agreed to do?" Because otherwise, you deplete all those resources, those those really scarce and special resources of the volunteer energy and the staff energy, on things that are not not going to get them where they need to go. Thank you for that, Diane. Any other comments or thoughts? Angela, um, Logan, I'm just wondering, has this uh, conversation sort of sparked your interest or possibilities in any particular area? I texted our whole group and said, I think we should have an annual or biannual engagement session. Um, plan one for the spring. I think it'd be really fun. So yeah, it's been a great presentation. Thanks guys. Oh, thanks Angela. Yeah, we're having, we're getting ready for ours uh, because of COVID, it's been delayed for so long, but we're hoping to have a in-person big community get together. And we're gonna, this time around, we're gonna do it in three parts. We're gonna do an, an entire all of community survey uh, with surveys links going into everybody's mailbox so that our, our we'll be able to know uh, how Ga what Gabrielans think about the needs in the community. And then we're gonna follow that with a big, uh, community workshop with up to 200 people involved in workshops and priority setting. And then we're going to follow that with the collaborative coming together as a team to say, how do we action this? So it'll be a three part process. It'll have speakers and all kinds of fun things. And yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about it. Of course, we have to find some money, but <laughs> uh, piece of cake. Piece of cake really helpful like next session or future session would be actually like going through your annual um, engagement sessions and what they kind of looked like presumably the first one was maybe smaller or maybe bigger but you know what I mean like kind of looking at the different years of like how you did it and you know is it facilitated or like you just said the surveys and that sort of stuff I think would be really helpful learning to yeah. um, hear about. And, and our chapter coordinator Angela Pounds um, I don't know if you know her but she's she's been involved from the get-go uh, so she knows uh, exactly how this has unfolded and has been actively involved even before she became the chapter coordinator. But yeah, happy. I mean, anybody wants to get in touch with me, I can put my email in the uh, chat and feel free to give me a shout. I'll just stick it in there right now. 
um, because I I could talk about this stuff until the cows come home, as you can probably tell. It gets me really excited, and um, and I like I like things that help people move ahead in communities. So so there it is. Feel free to email me. Angela, where are you based out of? I'm in Campbell River. Oh, okay, perfect. Well, interestingly enough, Angela, I just did some work in Campbell River with the Campbell River and District Coalition to End Homelessness. Yeah, so great, great organization, wonderful community. I like being up there. Yeah, we have lots of action tables with kind of various focuses and then it's, it gets a bit kind of incestual where everyone kind of sits on the same boards, right? So you, you kind of have the same kind of players and you kind of know each other from all the different parts. So yeah, we have lots of, um, you know, kind of active tables, early years and seniors and coalition yeah. and homelessness and all that sort of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it would be cool to bring us all together and see who could come. Yeah, yeah. Well, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. All communities benefit by doing that every once in a while. Excellent. Fran, um, I notice you joined. Welcome. Yes, I did. Sorry, I was late. I got caught up, but I thought I'd just come in for the last quarter of an hour. <laughs> it's a bit lame, but I thought I'll show my face. But oh, no, it's yeah. good to see you here. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm curious, you know, thinking about the communities where we work, Helen, up in Bella Bella and Bella Coola and um, Powell River as well. So, yeah, and also because it's going to happen in Whistler and I live in Whistler. And so it's like it's really interesting to think about how I would be as a citizen of a town or a community that's going to have a PCN as well. So sort of looking at it from two different perspectives. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it's really helpful to be on the receiving end, <laughs> to be able to offer um, and, and understand sort of the important, how it works and how things feel better yeah. um, as a as a resident, uh, Bella Bella and Bella Coola, really different communities, but in some ways similar to Gabriola, like actually quite small. I, I think uh, one of the things I find challenging in rural communities is that everyone knows one another there, and there's, it, there's historical relationships and there's connections that, um, and I think Diane, you said like, ask the community, they know, um, it's just, you know, we're often in a regional model going into community and not necessarily knowing all the details. But for the rural and remote division, what is really helpful is we have chapter coordinators who um, who, are, who have been or live in community. We have a few that don't. Um, Rhonda used to live, for example, in Bella Bella. She doesn't any longer, but I think you know Bella Bella <laughs> very well. And I, I think that that definitely helps to have those connections and relationships and and trust. Um, now we have six minutes left. Diane, any sort of um, most, you know, as folks think about it, because clearly people have, are walking away from this presentation thinking, wow, I really want to do, I want to engage our community. I want a network or a collaborative. You know, three kind of imparting ideas, thoughts to share and advice. Mm. that you can share, or two or three. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I, I guess, you know, my last slide um, sort of captured what I thought was really important. But the other thing is, I think, I think two things. One, you shouldn't be afraid of doing it, but you do need to frame your objective very carefully because you can't just walk in to a, hold a meeting and say, we're here to talk about health. It's way too broad, right? You need to frame what it is that you want to get out of the meeting. And probably when you're doing that work, it's really a good idea to start in advance by having conversations with people in the community, with, you know, key decision makers or important people like the grocery store clerks. COVID has made them very important in our lives <laughs> and many others, right? And to say, you know, what, what do you think would be important? What do you think we should try and, trying to achieve? So that when you actually get to that point where you're gonna have a meeting, you have a clear objective 
that pe you know people will get alongside you and support you in in that objective and be cons be prepared to adjust and reframe as you go along don't get stuck with the way you'd imagined that it should be and then you find yourself going down a path where you're getting people losing interest because in fact it needed to be tweaked so be okay with constant tweaking uh, be okay with disagreement oh here's my best one is actually yeah be really okay with disagreement uh, mm -hmm. it's out of disagreement that some great stuff happens but it's how it's handled that makes all the difference right so the opportunity uh, to set what do they call them often they call them community agreements is this is how we're going to be together right we're going to listen to each other we're going to be respectful and when people can have viewpoints and they can express them respectfully and anything goes you can put it all on the table so you, if you open that up and you're prepared to listen to people and prepared also to listen so carefully because i was at a session when we were talking about the critical priorities in our community, I mentioned we were saying, you know, what are the things that we find it hard to talk about and that we need to talk about? And we all thought that there was going to be, you know, some resounding thing about how we should have a bridge or not have a bridge, you know, the usual things that everybody goes at each other's throat over. But it came down to almost everybody in the room talked about the climate crisis. Now, this was two years ago. And it was like, it was not the thing that everybody was in disagreement on. It was the thing that people were most passionate to do. So you can give people the chance to talk about the difficult things because trust me, they will come together around the things that they're most passionate about because people naturally rise to the doable. And that's the job of the leaders in your community is to bring them to that place where they see what the doable is as opposed to the terrible, the I can't do it, it's too much, it's horrible, I'm, I'm a victim, and nobody's listening to me. So focus on find the doable, find the doable that most people agree on, and then do it. And everybody feels better as a result of that.